Distinguished, I'm Bill Reinch. I'm a senior advisor and the Shoal Chair in International Business here at CSIS. I'm very happy this afternoon to welcome a number of really excellent speakers to discuss a topic of uh, critical importance to economic security in the Indo-Pacific uh, and to our economy, much of the news of late. Uh, and uh, that is specifically the semiconductor supply chain resilience issue and friend shoring, the new word that if, well, there's friend shoring, there's ally shoring, there's near shoring, choose your adjective, but it's something that we're going to be exploring today. Uh, thanks to the generous support of Samsung, <clears throat> uh, the Shoal Chair and the Wadwani Center for AI have recently released two papers mapping out semiconductor supply chains in the Indo-Pacific and assessing opportunities for regional cooperation, primarily through uh, IPEF negotiations, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. The first paper, Securing Semiconductor Supply Chains in the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity, focuses on the geopolitics of the chip industry, identifying the IPEF framework as the most viable vehicle for executing the administration's friend shoring agenda in this sector. The second paper, Mapping the Semiconductor Supply Chain, the critical role of the Indo-Pacific region, offers data-driven insights about regional semiconductor ecosystems and the role that regional players occupy throughout the value chain. Together, these papers map opportunities for deeper regional integration to secure semiconductor supply chains. The CSIS Asia program organized this event to highlight key findings of this project that are embodied in, in both the papers, supplemented by the insights of industry and policy experts. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Michael Schmidt, who is the director of the CHIPS program office at the Department of Commerce uh, for a fireside, we have no fire, but we say this anyway, a fireside chat to discuss where the CHIPS and Science Act implementation stands, uh, how the current administration is approaching the friend shoring agenda. This will be followed by a panel discussion with uh, two of the co-authors of the papers, uh, Emily Benson and Greg Allen, and we will also, uh, they will also be joined by John Newfer, President and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, who will give us an industry perspective on all of this. And there's probably nobody in the, the town, certainly, and probably the country who knows more about the state of the industry than John does. Uh, to kick off the event, though, I want to welcome to the podium uh, Mark Lippert uh, to make some opening uh, remarks on behalf of, of Samsung, who, as I said, was generously sponsored this research. Mark is a non-resident senior advisor here at CSIS, so he's one of us. He's also executive vice president for Samsung, and as most of you know, he was also previously the U.S. ambassador to Korea. So, Mark, take over. All right, good afternoon, everyone, and deep thanks to Bill for such a terrific framing of this great session. Great to see everybody uh, here today. Huge turnout uh, in, in uh, in-person standards in the post-COVID era. I think it underscores how important this issue is. Uh, I just want to offer a big thanks to my former colleague at the Pentagon, Chris Johnstone, who is one of the very best public servants with whom I've served now here at CSIS for organizing this event. And of course, heartfelt welcome to Michael Schmidt, who I know we are looking forward to hearing from on this important fireside warm weather chat. Uh, last, deepest appreciation to our panelists, Emily Benson, Greg Allen, and John Newfer, as Bill mentioned, authors of key papers, deep experts in the industry. We're excited for what will be a robust discussion later in the program. Because we want to hear from Mr. Schmidt and the panelists, I will be extremely brief. And let me just say that Samsung is delighted to partner with CSIS to help bring this event together. And I just want to highlight a few reasons among many why this is an extremely well-timed and critically important session here today. First, in this era of economic security and industrial policy, at least in my mind, there is early consensus in Washington that a return of manufacturing and parts of the supply chain to the United States is an important national security and economic objective. What is less settled, however, is the important role of friends, partners, allies in all of this discussion. And as the Biden administration has identified, and to its great credit, a key strength of the United States is its network of friends, partners, and especially allies, and finding the right contours to effectively utilize these relationships in the spirit of true partnership, a two-way street, will be absolutely vital to getting this new framework right. 
Second, and further to the first point, partners bring new ideas, technologies, systems, resources, and perspective into this burgeoning ecosystem in the United States. These are key and critical ingredients for a potent and dynamic foundation of innovation for the 21st century. Samsung has long recognized its potential with its investments in the U.S. From the first international semiconductor fabrication facility in Austin, Texas in 96, to our newly announced multi-billion dollar joint electric battery ventures with GM and Stellantis in the U.S. heartland. In short, we get it. When you bring these core competencies together, the sum is greater than the whole, and that is a very good thing. Last, working with friends, partners, allies is by definition global. These relationships, especially collaboration on some of the most sensitive technologies, de facto help strengthen a free and open commerce, or free and open commerce rather, that in, at, in turn requires strong national and international institutions. Together, this brings us closer to an international order where people, institution, entities are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated. Indeed, important principles to strengthen in an uncertain geopolitical environment. Let me close by saying that I could go, along, go on much longer. This discussion is critical, but the audience here both A, gets it, and is already tired of me talking, B. Uh, so let me once again extend my thanks to Bill and Chris, and a warm welcome to Michael and the distinguished panelists. With both my Samsung and CSIS hats, I will say we look forward to a vigorous and important session of vital importance to the 21st century. Thank you. Oh, God. Wow. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks to uh, both Bill and Mark for the terrific opening remarks. Uh, I'm Chris Johnstone. I'm Senior Advisor and Japan Chair uh, here at CSIS, and it really is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Schmidt, the Director of the CHIPS Program Office at the Department of Commerce. Uh, Tarun Chabra was uh, unable to join us today, but we're delighted. I think we actually have uh, uh, an even more insightful uh, visitor here today. I don't so. know. Tarun can be watching. This is live stream. Uh, so, uh, I would never say such to... a thing. Would... <laughs> but prior to joining, let me just introduce Michael quickly for those of you who aren't familiar with him. Prior to joining Commerce, he worked with the U.S. Department of Treasury overseeing the child tax credit program in the American Rescue Plan. He also served as commissioner of the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance uh, and as deputy secretary for economic development in New York. Uh, so Michael is one of the very few experts with extensive experience in implementing large scale programs who is selected by the Biden administration uh, to support the implementation of the CHIPS Act. So really delighted to have um, uh, Michael here today and to, to discuss uh, how the administration is working to square the circle on uh, domestic industrial strategy uh, and uh, the international friendshoring agenda when it comes to semiconductors. So let me start, uh, Mike, by really sort of giving you a chance to talk about where we are with CHIPS Act implementation. Uh, uh, and in particular, I think there's a lot of, um, particularly in the international media, um, a discussion not always accurate about what the CHIPS Act is and what it isn't. So mm -hmm. I want to give you a chance to say where we are and address some of uh, what's out there in terms of a narrative. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, and thank you all uh, for having me. Thanks to CSIS for, for having me. I'm very excited to be here and to serve as a relief pitcher uh, for Tarun uh, for, this, for this event. Um, big picture, what we are trying to do at Commerce with CHIPS is something, a muscle our nation hasn't exercised um, in a while. Uh, this is a large scale uh, public investment in private industry that doesn't really have recent precedent. Um, the, the, the part of the program that um, my office is responsible for is section 9902 of the bill. That's the 39 billion for manufacturing incentives. There's another 11 billion at Commerce focused on R&D and then important programs um, at other agencies like State, Defense, um, and uh, NSF. Um, and as we kind of confronted the challenge of what was essentially uh, a pretty broad statutory directive to invest um, in uh, the semiconductor I uh, industry here in the United States, really scoped it out 
in, in three key buckets. What does it take to be successful? The first is vision, right? Um, there is one way to do a program like this where you uh, make the investments and then you tell the story about what you achieved, right? You put the stars in the sky and then you draw the constellation, right? We uh, felt very strongly that as a matter of um, accountability to taxpayers, accountability to Congress, signaling to our applicants um, that we had an obligation to articulate our North Stars, what we were trying to achieve up front, right? And then build a program around that. So we uh, uh, did deep thinking on what we called our vision for success, um, which articulated uh, a set of objectives around leading edge logic, current generation and mature semiconductors, advanced packaging, really um, important priority memory. Um, we recently put out another vision paper focused on the upstream supply chain. So material and equipment suppliers, Nikita, who's in the audience, uh, was the leader in driving, driving that work. So laying that vision, we think, is hugely important for um, uh, the, uh, setting the agenda for the overall program. Um, the second thing you need once you lay that vision is program. The, 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 the pipes, the nuts and bolts of how the thing is going to fit together. Um, and that was our first funding opportunity, which we recently updated to include um, uh, upstream suppliers uh, with uh, projects exceeding $300 million, um, in addition to uh, the, the fabrication facilities that we opened for in February. And um, you know, we feel really good about where we are with our program. Um, we have received tremendous interest, nearly 400 statements of interest from potential applicants across the semiconductor ecosystem, leading edge, uh, current mature equipment, materials, R&D projects, tremendous interest in participating in the program and investing in the United States, which of course is going to put real challenge on us to be thoughtful about how we are uh, deploying taxpayer dollars. And, and there's no question that uh, we have got some tough choices we're going to have to make um, that we're going to have to make ahead. So you have the vision, you have the program. Um, and then the third thing, which is absolutely essential, uh, as you all know, is team. Um, and uh, we, what, what this requires from the standpoint of human capital is uh, not, is a combination of talents that is distinct, I think, pretty distinctive in the context of modern government. And we have built a team in the Chief's <coughs> Program Office uh, under Secretary Romano's leadership that is uh, among the most talented groups of uh, public servants you'll see. Um, we have um, tremendous uh, talent from the private sector, so investment backgrounds, banking backgrounds, consulting backgrounds, tremendous talent from government, defense, national security, economic security, workforce, NEPA and permitting, all these core talents. We have a risk team, operations. We have 115 people now I'm in the CHIPS program office, and, um, and we are less than a year uh, into, into implementation. So we are now um, actively in program execution mode. And uh, we, we've, we've built a team. We've articulated our vision. We've built the program. And uh, now's the fun part. Great. Appreciate those comments. Let, let me ask you, uh, this is admittedly a broad question, but I think it's useful to start with this. How you think about uh, the line between industrial policy uh, and uh, a market-driven semiconductor industry. My colleague Greg Allen uh, has written a paper for this project that lays out, maps, the immensely complex and truly global semiconductor industry um, and the innovation that it has uh, driven in recent years. So a question for you is how do you think about um, a policy that both um, promotes the resilience that we all agree that we need without disrupting uh, unduly this ecosystem that has been so vital to, to the innovation that we're benefiting from? I, I hear that question, and the first thing I think about is how little money we actually have relative to the scale of the industry, relative to the amount of investment that happens in the industry around the world. And that investment over the course of decades has produced one of the most complicated sophisticated, innovative, efficient, technologically advanced supply chains in the history of the world. Um, and the scale of that, 
global international investment, the strength of those market forces to drive that innovation and drive that efficiency has resulted in tremendous benefits to the welfare of our country and to the welfare of countries around the world, right? And our $39 billion isn't going to change that. Um, we have to think of our money as uh, money that is going to, on the margin, increase resiliency in ways that accrue to the benefit of our nation from an economic uh, and national security perspective and does so in a way that is coordinated with our partners and allies um, so that we are building a uh, globally resilient um, semiconductor ecosystem. But uh, in no way is that going to um, be a replacement for or in any way disrupt the tremendous power <laughs> of the market forces that are driving uh, innovation, um, efficiency, and resilience across the globe. I want to come back to this, uh, the, the point you made about coordinated with partners and allies, but ask you maybe to, to um, address a little more broadly um, how the administration is thinking about the friend shoring part of the agenda. I think, I think it would be fair to say, um, at least the perception is, that the emphasis, the focus has been on the reshoring component. Um, how would you talk broadly about uh, the, the friend shoring dimension of the strategy? Yeah, I understand that perception, but I wouldn't discount how uh, the extent of the administration's focus on the uh, international aspects of supply chain resilience and the need for a kind of globally coordinated strategy. Um, I sit within the Commerce Department where uh, we have um, obviously are a big part of driving the IPEF discussion, um, work very closely with our colleagues in, in ITA, work very closely with our colleagues um, throughout the government, but also within my team on the CHIPS program office, um, we have a, an international engagement team, right? So we have sent, my team has been to Japan, to Taiwan, to Korea, to Europe. Uh, we have engaged dialogues with Europe through the TTC, Obviously, India um, last week, but also through the broader technology dialogues with India um, and really around the world, right? It is a conversation that, that can happen anywhere. It's, IPEF is a hugely important part of it. Obviously, the kind of um, North and South American ecosystem can be a really important part of it. Um, and it is, uh, it is um, uh, uh, you know, making sure that we're situating our investments within a, a global context is something that has been an important focus for us. Can you say more about the, this effort to coordinate? I, I mean, it, it, as I look around the region, since the passage of the CHIPS Act, it, it seems that a number of our partners have launched their own initiatives to promote reshoring in their own economies, right? Japan is starting a, a program of new subsidies. Korea recently passed its own version of their calling a, a CHIPS Act, which um, is focused on tax incentives. How do we avoid a dynamic in which we have sort of competing industrial policies that could, if not coordinated effectively, result in sort of duplicative um, investments. Duplicative or even more harmful, mm -hmm. um, from our perspective, create unproductive race to the bottom type dynamics, right? Where you end up subsidizing more than you need to to achieve a certain level of investment, uh, which um, you know ends up being a much less efficient use of taxpayer dollars and winds up with kind of rents for the, for the recipients of, of that funding. Um, and that just requires you know, all of us who are doing the work of this implementation to roll up our sleeves, to be coordinated, to model globally responsible behavior, um, and to, uh, and to um, again, recognize. I mean, from my perspective, I think about it, what I said earlier, $39 billion. We're going to have a lot more interest in that. <laughs> Right, and so it, it's going to be okay to, to, you know, like we will celebrate um, investments around the world that are helping us to build global supply chain resilience, uh, even as we really focus on um, making the investments we need to uh, make it here at home to advance our economic national security mm -hmm. objectives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask you about uh, the 
the two-pronged approach, if you will, I think that the administration has taken to um, critical technology, the promote and protect uh, dimensions of the strategy. Um, domestic incentives like the CHIPS Act, restrictive measures like the uh, export control measures that were announced uh, last October. How are you engaging allied, allies and partners on, on that piece, on this, this two-pronged approach, and, and what is your sense of uh, the level of alignment uh, philosophically in that area? So I'll be very honest, I'm really engaged in the promote side. Um, and obviously BIS is, is within commerce and uh, is working um, on the, what, what you articulate, the protect side, the export control side, um, as part of a broader strategy um, for this administration um, to create the type of resilient global supply chains and combat the um, uh, technology transfer that um, is uh, harmful to our broader uh, broader national security. I do think that um, those two pieces have to work together very well and that the promote side is just absolutely essential to meeting the broader objectives, right? Making the investments here at home that uh, ensures that we here in the United States are able to produce the technologies that are driving uh, geopolitics, driving innovation, driving economic growth, um, for, for the decades to come. Yeah. Um, excellent. Let's, uh, I want to ask you about um, the, the, the various initiatives that we see underway internationally uh, to promote cooperation in this space. We see, for example, uh, the CHIP4 alliance uh, still, I think, developing, but with Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan to promote uh, cooperation in the sector. Uh, my colleague Emily Benson has written about um, IPEF and the potential role that it could play uh, in, in this space in, in helping to develop a, a more secure, resilient supply chain. As you noted in your remarks, uh, Prime Minister Modi last week in his visit, uh, one of the results um, of that visit was an announcement on deeper semiconductor cooperation with India. How do these initiatives tie together? Uh, and is there any risk of um, overload, uh, ending up working at cross purposes. How, how do you see these things coming together in a, in a coherent strategy? I think that there is a role to be played for various fora, right? And each of these fora kind of comes together for its own particular reason, whether it's IPEF that brings together the entire Indo-Pacific region, whether it's the CHIPS 4 that brings together uh, a set of economies that have a deep history um, and history of engagement on semiconductor-related issues, or critically importantly, those types of bilateral discussions like we're having uh, with India. Um, obviously, the TTC in Europe is usually um, important too. And fundamentally, all these conversations are working towards the same objective, right? Driving investment in partner and allied economies that are going to contribute to our collective um, economic and national security. And the other thing, I think John will tell you this uh, when he's up here next, um, you know, governments have a role to play, but a lot of this is being going to be driven organically um, by, uh, by companies who are looking at their own supply chains, their own plans, and um, uh, charting paths forward that, uh, that you know, for them, add greater resilience as well. Uh, in terms of their own supply chain diversification, and I don't think uh, I think it's important to understand that part of the dynamic too. Yeah, yeah. At the end, right at the end of the day, this is a, a sector that's whose activity is vastly larger than the government uh, uh, levers brought to bear. Um, okay, I, I'd like to open this up to um, uh, to questions uh, from the floor, if there. Um, so please, we'll go right here in the front. Uh, yes, hi. Um, I'm Dong Hyun Kim from um, Yonhap News Agency based in um, South Korea. Um, the companies that received the Chipsec funds, um, you're placing some requirements, and among one of them is the um, guardrail provision, preventing them from expanding manufacturing capacity in China. And I'm just wondering, um, are there concerns among the um, companies about this provision? Um, as you talk to the 400 um, companies that have shown interest, um, is this something that could perhaps hold them back from um, applying for the funds? Thank you. 
Thanks for that question. So the question is about the guardrails that are part of the, the CHIPS Act, um, which uh, prohibit recipients from our funding from um, expanding manufacturing activity for semiconductors in, in countries of, of concern. Um, as you may know, we put out a regulation articulating uh, or kind of defining some of the key terms in, in that provision. And we have received comment on the proposed rulemaking and we're in the process of finalizing the rule. So I can't speak to any of the specifics there or uh, with respect to any specific commenters. What I can say is what I said earlier, which is we are seeing tremendous interest um, in, in the program and investing in the United States um, from applicants who uh, look at the legislation, including the guardrails, um, are, are looking at their plans for the decade to come and expressing significant interest in investing in the United States as part of our program. Other questions from the floor? Yeah, here in the middle. Hello, thank you very much. Um, interning at the Simpson Center. And this was uh, uh, briefly touched upon when you're talking about avoiding redundancies with um, international initiatives for uh, securing uh, resiliency supply chains. But I was wondering, obviously, the United States is a much bigger player um, in the world than Japan or Taiwan. And I was wondering, is when the U.S. comes out with uh, these initiatives, do you see it has an impact on other countries where they kind of center their own strategies on what the United States is doing and um, how that may affect international cooperation? Thank you. I, um, well, yes, the United States is a major global economy, um, but, but we should not underestimate <laughs> the significance and sophistication of the semiconductor industry um, in some of these other countries. And um, I, I think there's no question that we all uh, are, you know, we are all watching a story unfold, <laughs> a kind of collective appreciation um, among allied and partner economies and the importance of kind of investing in resilience, particularly as it comes to the semiconductor supply chain. But I also think countries are going to take a, um, a look at their own ecosystems, um, their own economic dynamics, and they'll, uh, you know, will devise strategies that, that make sense um, individually. And then our job is to make sure that we are um, creating the right dialogues so that we're kind of working together as allies and partners. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the from the, Greg? Yes, I had a feeling Greg would want to chime in here. Yeah, it's uh, it's bad form to ask a question at an event that you're also speaking at. <laughs> but, uh, I'm that kind of guy, as Chris said, he already knew. Um, so I'm very curious about metrics for success. So you're investing, you know, 39 billion dollars in manufacturing. Uh, you know, a, a leading edge chip fab is uh, $20 billion. Um, obviously, that's not explicitly what you're doing. It's just buying a fab. But my point is that if you built just one fab, it would actually be a bad return on investment, right? Because it only cost $20 billion. You spent $39 billion. You only got one. So I'm just curious, you know, how does commerce know whether they got their money's worth for this $39 billion investment? Um, what metrics are you looking at to define success? Uh, qualitative, quantitative, otherwise. And I'd be curious, you know, because you're making investments up and down the value chain and the supply chain, you know, whether or not it's the same or, or different for different segments of the supply chain. So, um, really important question. And it is questions like that that drove us to put out our vision for success paper that really articulated for all stakeholders to see what it is we are trying to achieve. Um, we articulated an ambition of having two self-sustaining, leading-edge logic clusters with the infrastructure and supplier and workforce ecosystems needed to uh, sustain uh, those clusters going forward. Um, investments in memory, as I said, advanced packaging, um, current generation, and, and mature production. When the secretary gave her speech before we launched our NOFO, she said, uh, you know, decades from now, when, we're, when we are evaluated for what we do, we will be judged on two things. 
did we advance our economic and national security, and were we good stewards of taxpayer dollars, right? And those two things, uh, which are foundational to our success, to your point, are self-reinforcing, right? They, uh, the better deal we can get on behalf of taxpayers on any particular transaction, the more we can do to advance our economic and national security um, with, our, with our funds. Um, and fundamentally, our job as a team within the Commerce Department, Chips Program Office, um, is to evaluate the, um, you know, the return on our investment. And our return is not financial. Our return is, um, is you know, the resilience, the technology leadership, the national security benefits that we create. So to build on that, so, so from, as you, as you think about this question of metrics, um, five, let's say five years from now, uh, what, what does success look like from, in, in, from a kind of medium term perspective? So the vision paper that I keep referencing puts out 10 year objectives, right, across um, leading edge logic uh, and memory, current generation mature, uh, uh, advanced packaging as well as, as the supply chain. We spent a lot of time thinking about, oh, should we put out particular production metrics for this uh, category of semiconductor manufacturing? Um, uh, and ultimately decided that that was, uh, number one, kind of too narrow as a description of what it is we were trying to achieve. And number two, doesn't account for the fact that we're going to allocate our dollars in part based on kind of what the investment category is, but in part based on how good a deal we can get, right? Um, and so we want to have the flexibility to be nimble in, in, um, in how we're thinking about it as well. Okay. I, I will say though that, that the, you know, when you zoom out, what do we want the world to look like five, 10 years from now? We want the world's leading semiconductor companies to view investment in the United States as core to their business model, right? That is when you kind of abstract from all the specifics, all the categories of investment, um, that is a fundamental measure of success that we, uh, we will be tracking for sure. Great. Had a question here and then we'll go into the back. Hi, I'm Sam Howell with uh, CNAS. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about talent. Um, does the United States have the STEM talent required to achieve the objectives of the CHIPS Act? And if not, are there any workforce development initiatives underway you can speak to? It's a hugely important question. Um, number one, yes, the United States does have the talent. And when you talk to international semiconductor companies, one of the most attractive things about investing in the United States is the institutions of higher education um, and the workforce that the United States is capable of producing and advancing uh, investment in, in the global industry. But it, meeting the specific demands on a project by project basis is gonna be like a really important challenge and we are gonna need um, a really strong approach. Um, and so, that includes from the, uh, the investments that we're overseeing in the CHIPS program office, the manufacturing incentives. Workforce and investment is an eligible category um, for uh, expenditure. And um, we've asked our applicants to submit robust workforce plans that explain to us how they're going to find, recruit, train, retain the talent necessary to build and operate um, fabrication facilities, but also through the R&D side of the equation, the 11 billion that'll be invested in the National Semiconductor Technology Center um, through programs at uh, NSF, um, we will be making major um, national investments in the semiconductor workforce um, that will uh, be absolutely essential for us to meet our long-term objectives. I think there's a question in the back, and then we'll have time just for maybe one more after that. 
Hi, my name is Laurel Schwartz. I'm with the China Project. Um, so you mentioned the bilateral negotiations that happened with India last week and our ability to, the United States' ability to attract talent, as well as our goals always being to get the best bang for the buck and, and protect national security. With India's growing population, China looking for new markets, India looking for new markets, India has you know, a, a lot in their hand to play with. In that 10-year plan that you talked about, what's to prevent India from saying, well, actually, it's hard for us to get visas for the US, they have a lot of regulations, it's expensive, the Chinese are right over there, why should we not just go with them where they might look the other way for some things? Um, I guess I, well, I would just say that we would view investment in India as um, a, uh, a joint shared objective um, between our two countries right now. And there's a lot of interest in American companies uh, investing in India, as well as other parts of IPEF. Um, and, uh, and obviously, we want to coordinate with India through, um, through our bilateral dialogues in terms of advancing those shared objectives. But a lot of that is happening organically um, regardless. And it's something that I think it's a trend that we, uh, we certainly welcome and are excited about. Yeah, the relationship with India has uh, undergone a remarkable transformation. If you look at that joint statement released last week, the, the sweep of, of and scope of cooperation is really quite something. Uh, we've got time for one more. Uh, let's, uh, let's go back here. Hi, I'm Ethan with Ensign. Um, I guess I'm curious, so based on some of the things we're looking at, it seems like um, China's trying to gain like a monopoly over like the low-end chip manufacturing segment. Um, so are we doing anything within the CHIPS Act to sort of increase, I guess, not only the most advanced chip manufacturing, but also like middle and, and low-end manufacturing? Yeah, that's a, well. so that's this question. Are, are we introducing vulnerabilities at the low end with our focus at the high end? Yeah, I would say that we are focused at the high end, but we are not uh, ex uh, focused exclusively at the high end. Um, and we have made very, uh, clear um, that investments in current generation mat more mature chips um, are really essential in terms of meeting our overall uh, economic national security supply chain resilience goals um, and as you as you likely know um, many of those investments are uh, fueling um, <coughs> industries that are absolutely essential to our economy, uh, critical to our defense industrial base, um, and were areas where uh, during the pandemic we actually saw the most significant supply chain disruptions. And so, um, you know, it, it's definitely an important part of our overall strategy here. Great. Well, Mike, thanks very much for, uh, for joining us today. I, I, you are in charge of a hugely important effort uh, that contributes both to our, our prosperity here at home, but also to our broader national security strategy. So we're grateful for the time that you spent with us today, and thanks for sharing your thoughts. Please join me uh, in a round of applause for, uh, for Mike.
right. Well, thanks to all of, of you again for joining us this, this afternoon. We're ready to transition to our panel uh, discussion. Again, thanks very much to, to Mike Schmidt for joining us this afternoon. We have a terrific uh, panel uh, discussion for you this afternoon. Uh, let me do brief introductions and then we'll get right into, uh, right into the discussion. So to my right is Emily Benson. She is director of the Project on Trade and Technology and a senior fellow with the Scholl Chair in International Business. And she's the co-writer of the first of our two papers uh, that were released as part of this project on securing semiconductor supply chains in the Indo-Pacific Economic uh, uh, Framework for Prosperity, Squaring the Circle on Deeper Cooperation. Uh, Emily is an expert analyst in technology and export controls as well as supply chain security. So very glad to have her here. On my left is Greg Allen. Uh, he's the director of the Wadwani Center for uh, AI and Advanced Technologies and senior fellow in the Strategic Technologies Program here at CSIS. And he's co-writer of the second paper in this series, Mapping the Semiconductor Supply Chain, the Critical Role of the Indo-Pacific Region. Uh, Greg has several years of experience in both the private and public sectors, spanning AI, robotics, semiconductors, space technology, and national security. Uh, and then on my far right is John Newfer, who's president uh, and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, which is the leading advocacy group for the chip industry that works to advance policies uh, to support industry growth uh, and find solutions to common challenges by facilitating collaboration between U.S. leadership uh, and key industry stakeholders. So delighted to have them here. We'll I invite each of our speakers to offer some thoughts um, uh, in turn, we'll start with Emily, and, and for our speakers, feel free also to, um, uh, to react in any way that you like to what you heard from Mike Schmidt uh, earlier today as part of your remarks. But Emily, first, um, over to you for a few minutes of remarks. Sure, thank you so much, Chris, uh, for putting this together, and also the folks at Samsung. I'd also like to thank my colleagues, uh, Jaffet Kitsan, who is somewhere in Bill Ranch, who helped uh, put this project together as well. Um, I will say a couple of very high-level words about the front-shoring agenda and the increasing infusion of national security into economic and trade policy. And I think parts of that uh, were reflected in the remarks that we heard just before. Um, so under this administration, the um, White House is pursuing kind of a top-down front-shoring approach, which we also heard about. I think in very simplistic terms, that means an effort to convince companies and countries to move supply chains into friendly countries that do not pose an imminent national security uh, threat. At the same time, the administration has pursued an expanded industrial policy toolkit with the 52 billion Chips and Science Act, but at the same time uh, expanded its use of export controls on the high-tech sector. So what our paper looked at was really how to square the circle, how to reconcile this expanded use of controls and also the expanded use of industrial policy that I think leaves some allies wondering what's in it for them to cooperate. I think I've heard from a lot of um, countries, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, that they view this industrial policy as attracting production here. Uh, they're also subject to export controls, and so they want to know uh, really what's in it uh, over the, the expanded time horizon. So we looked at the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, uh, which is the Biden administration's economic policy complement to its security policy in the Indo-Pacific. It consists of 14 countries, including the United States, and it's built around four primary pillars, uh, spanning trade, uh, supply chain resiliency, uh, climate change mitigation, and then fair uh, taxation and transparency issues. So what we really looked at was to what degree the administration is leveraging the Indo-Pacific economic framework uh, to make progress on securing semiconductor supply chains. Interestingly, it doesn't seem like they've really uh, made full use of the Indo-Pacific economic framework, but at the end of the day, uh, I think it is a viable vehicle for deepening resiliency across uh, various sectors, including semiconductors. Part of that can be explained by the diversity of membership in the Indo-Pacific economic framework. Uh, it spans countries like India, which would like to play a far greater role in semiconductor uh, industry activities, as we saw last week. Uh, there are also kind of at the other end of the spectrum, 
uh, countries that are already very deeply involved, such as South Korea <coughs> or Japan. Another consideration in the IPEF is to what degree countries who are participating share the idea that export controls are really an integral part of trade policy. And the idea there is that if we're going to promote a high tech sector, it's important to also protect where it's going. You don't want uh, dual use goods, those with civilian and military capabilities to end up uh, in the hands of adversaries. Uh, so basically it's important to take into account uh, where things are going and also the diversity of membership who's already doing what at various points of the supply chain. And I know Greg will go into much more detail about the specifics and who's playing what role uh, across the supply chain. So at the end of the day, we came up with eight recommendations, and I think we probably don't have time to go into all of them here today, but I've condensed them into a couple of quick recommendations. And I think one thing that is worth bearing in mind for the administration is that the trade and industrial policies need to build in reciprocity with key allies. Uh, this goes back to making sure that we have adequate incentives uh, to make sure that allies continue to buy into this agenda over time. I think very uh, a condensed version is that these industrial measures will probably need to be iterative. As Greg pointed out in his question, 52 billion or 39 billion on manufacturing isn't that much at the end of the day. So we'll have to probably do more from a fiscal perspective. Uh, another key finding is that trade policy should still remain part of the equation. And we hear from allied uh, economies very frequently that they're left wanting a little bit more, both in terms of market access provisions and also tariff reductions. And if we look at the efficiencies that we've built in via trade policy uh, through the last couple of generations of economic engagement, those policies have really succeeded in driving up efficiencies. Um, another key component which we've outlined in previous CSIS reports is to put effort into building trusted partnerships. And here, over the long horizon, it really goes into building export control capacity, building the right policy toolkit, and then also over time, the right enforcement toolkit. Uh, so overall, the best thing to do now is to double down on trade and economic engagement, make sure that it's reciprocal with allies, and to take into account that we'll probably need uh, a little bit of deeper engagement across IPEF members over time. So let me conclude there and pass it back to you, Chris. That's great, Emily. Terrific opening remarks. I want to come back to you on this question of trade policy and what other incentives we might have to bring to bear to encourage cooperation in this space. But let me turn next to... Greg Allen, who, uh, as I noted, wrote a really terrific paper mapping the supply chain uh, for the semiconductor in industry in the Indo-Pacific that I think really speaks to the complexity of the problem that we, that we face. Greg. Well, thanks. Uh, and I should point out that my, that paper uh, was co-authored with my colleague, uh, Akhil Fadani, uh, who's also part of the Wadwani Center team. Um, so I want to start by just pointing out that you know, the CHIPS Act in particular is often framed in the United States media uh, as a counter-China policy. Um, and it is indeed true that uh, of the hundreds of senators and representatives who voted for the CHIPS Act, uh, some explicitly voted you know, with the goal of increasing U.S. competitiveness vis-a-vis uh, -vis China in economic terms, in national security terms. But hundreds of representatives and senators voted uh, for the CHIPS Act, and not all of them were voting for that reason. There was a lot of reasons uh, to support something like the CHIPS Act. And I want to dwell on the resilience of the supply chain in particular as a reason why uh, the CHIPS Act, which, you know, as you just heard, is the most significant U.S. government investment in private sector industry in a really long time. Um, and the reason for that is that the supply chain disruptions to the semiconductor industry have proven themselves to be enormously consequential. Uh, as a result of the sort of COVID pandemic and the supply chain disruptions that flowed through the semiconductor industry and the supply chain in 2021, the United States Department of Commerce estimates that those supply chain disruptions shaved a full percentage point off of US GDP in 2021. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars in lost economic activity uh, as a result of shortages of semiconductors. And that is just because 
semiconductors are only a small slice of US GDP in the raw industry terms, but they are a crucial underpinning of an enormous share of US economic activity. Uh, Goldman Sachs did some analysis on this, and they said that the semiconductor industry in the United States is only 0.3% of GDP, but is a direct input to 13% of GDP. And when just a shortage of these types of components is enough to shave hundreds of billions of dollars off of the economy, you can understand why Congress, why the White House <laughs> felt that $39 billion was actually not that much of an insurance premium to pay you know, when you're faced with these types of risks. So what are they paying for? They're paying for a more resilient semiconductor supply chain. I think that the complexity of the semiconductor supply chain is often masked to the end user. They know that the chips they're buying have an Intel logo on them or that their Apple phone contains chips that Apple advertises it designed those chips. But designing chips is just one part of the equation. Manufacturing chips is just one part of the equation. There are so many different industries that have to operate at such an extraordinary degree of precision, of reliability, and of quality uh, and volume that it's almost difficult to overstate uh, just what an extraordinary ballet of industrial and economic activity is taking place for any chip to end up anywhere uh, in the global economy. And that supply chain for many decades has been operating under a principle uh, called just-in-time, right, which is an economic efficiency paradigm of showing up exactly when you're needed and not before, so you sort of minimize the cost at every stage in the production. And I think we're moving to a new era of the global economy that is increasingly defined by just-in-case which is looking at the downsides, uh, the potential downsides of economic dependence on countries of concern, that is looking at the potential downsides of over-reliance on specific nodes that might be subject to disruptions for any number of reasons. Uh, but against all of that, I think the United States sees that the semiconductor industry is going nowhere but up, by which I mean I could not point to a single trend in the global economy that does not seem to indicate that semiconductors are becoming increasingly critical to every part of economic activity. So I think that $39 billion investment is an investment in expected growth. It's not about capturing the share of a shrinking pie. It's about ensuring there's enough capacity to address what is fun fundamentally a rapidly growing market uh, around the world and ensuring that the United States wants to occupy a leading position in that. Um, and that's why these types of investments, I believe, are compatible with a strategy of recognizing the critical role that U.S. allies play. In the Indo-Pacific region, Taiwan, Korea, Japan are all juggernauts uh, of various segments of the semiconductor supply chain. Um, Taiwan and Korea are, of course, extraordinarily good at semiconductor fabrication, uh, but also play important roles in the materials and chemicals uh, segment. Japan uh, is extraordinarily good not only at materials and chemicals, but also semiconductor uh, manufacturing equipment, and I could go on and on and on. In the different links in this, Japan, in this chain, our allies play a critical role, uh, and the paper, uh, which I would hope uh, all of you would find interesting enough to read, is really about mapping uh, all of that complexity uh, and making it available to policymakers in the United States and around the world. That's great, great, thanks. I want to come back to you on the question of how, um, as, as Emily also tried to address, is how, how do we incentivize our partners to work with us on this, uh, on this agenda? John, um, the industry perspective on all of this. How is industry navigating these, con these, these different strands uh, of U.S. policy, this focus on, on reshoring and resilience at home, but also a, a commitment to a, a friendshoring uh, agenda that is perhaps somewhat less defined? How, how is industry um, navigating all of this? Carefully and enthusiastically. <laughs> Um, first of all, thanks, Mark, Samsung, and uh, CSIS for making this whole thing uh, possible. It's a great, great forum. Um, I had a bunch of stuff written down, but I want to respond to stuff, stuff that's been said. First of all, great papers. Uh, I, 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 I've been uh, head of SIA for eight and a half years, and, and I read the, all those paper, both those papers and, and learned a lot from them. So thank you for get, getting that stuff out there. Very valuable. 
If there's one thing that I'd like folks to pay a little bit more attention to when they're talking about industrial strategy or industrial policy, it's how do you, as someone who worked at USTR for seven and a half years, what kind of complementary trade policy do you need in place to, um, in terms of market access in particular, to help promote the industrial policy? So one of the big objectives, if not the biggest objective, is to, by the way, we use the phrase onshore, not reshore. You don't move a $10 billion fab from Singapore or $20 billion from Singapore to here. You build a new one, new one here, so it's onshoring stuff. So, so um, 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 we, we need to, so the, the whole objective is to build, build more stuff here. And it's not just chips, but other sectors as well. It's a big objective of this, of this administration. Uh, if you're going to do that, well, chips, 80% of our customers are overseas. So uh, we want bigger markets overseas. And what's one way to get bigger markets overseas? Market access agreements, lowering tariffs. The reality is most of our tariffs are de minimis tariffs anyway, nuisance tariffs. So when we're talking about reducing tariffs, we're talking about reducing tariffs of the other guy. And we can't really do that bilaterally. We have to do that in a multilateral setting, like the WTO. That's why the information technology agreement was so important for us as, as an industry. That, that's my first point. Second point is, um, um, it's about uh, Indo-Pacific and how important it is for us. So, so decoupling is uh, uh, a protectionist fairy tale. It's just, just something that's not gonna happen in our industry. Our industry is, and, and Mike Schmidt referred to this earlier, our industry is, is so potent and innovative for two fundamental reasons. One, we invest about 20% of our sales back into R&D. We're right up there with pharmaceuticals in terms of R&D intensity. But the other thing is, over the decades, we have very effectively built out these amazing supply chains around the world, and that has fed our innovation. So to think that somehow we're gonna diminish those supply, uh, um, supply chains is, is really kind of fantasy. So, so I, I, I think we just, just it, it, we've got to write that off. Um, well, there's de-risking too, and part of the de-risking is relying more on our friends and allies. And a huge center of gravity for our supply chains is the Indo-Pacific, Southeast Asia, East Asia, Korea, Japan, Taiwan, Malaysia, Singapore. Critically important um, pieces to our supply chain. And um, tying that to what's happening with the CHIPS legislation. Well, the CHIPS legislation Objective is to bring more manufacturing here in the U.S. But the administration has been very smart in talking about how we got to get our friends and allies stronger in terms of their supply chain resiliency when it comes to chips. And one really kind of really very positive outcome of all this is that many of those friends and allies in, in the Pacific are embracing chips legislation very enthusiastically, whether it's on the R cooperating on the R&D side of it, the 11 billion that was referenced earlier, but on the grant side, we have some major players, some represented in this room, that are, are gonna be applying for these, for these grants. And I think that's a real, well, there are strings attached to this, and let's face it, it's a lot of taxpayer dollars, so we're gonna get some strings attached. Notwithstanding all that, we still have uh, some of our friends and allies, companies in, the, in, the, in, the, in, in those countries that are embracing and are going to be uh, participating in, the, in this effort. A um, couple, of, couple other things. $39 billion, that's a lot of money to me. That's, that's not shop liver. It's a lot of taxpayer money. For our industry, okay, you could say it's not so much, but it's really a catalyst. Um, let's, let's say you're going to build a $10 billion fab, and let's say you get, I don't know, a couple billion dollars for grants. And then there's an investment tax credit, which is 25%. And then there's the requirement to have state participation. And then you're getting up to levels that are equivalent to some of the gold standards around the world with incentive programs like, like Singapore. So when you, when you kind of break it down, it's actually very good, good kind of opening position for, for the U.S. government. The question of of moral hazard. Um, are we gonna end up with too much overcapacity and who's gonna decide what's going where? 
Well, the beauty with the CHIPS Act, and some other countries have done it this way, smartly, is that there is a ton of private sector investment involved in this. So far, there's already $200 billion plus committed by our, by our industry. And if, let's say, you have that $10 billion fab and, and the private sector component of that $6 billion, well, that's a ton of money. That's a huge roll, in the, roll of the dice for, for any CEO of, of, of a chip company. And when they're looking at where to put a fab, because we all know there's going to be, there, there's exploding demand for chips, we need more capacity around the world, CEO is going to be thinking about where the best place to do that is. And, and, and they're not, this is going to be not some willy-nilly adventure. Um, and then finally, ROI, return on investment. I think 10 years out, if the U.S. is a place where people want to build semiconductor facilities in a, in a robust way, that's a victory. Um, right now, well, not now, but before the CHIPS Act was passed, it was 25 to 50 percent more expensive to put a fab in the U.S. than it was overseas. So no wonder we hear this number. 1990, we manufactured 37 percent of the world's chips. Now we manufacture 10 to 12 percent. The number one reason for that is the manufacturing incentives weren't in place here while they were overseas. So um, it seems to me that if we can, with if high, high, high you know, uh, um, leveling things up a bit, if we can turn that around, we've, we're in decline, if we can get that turned around in the next 10 years and start moving up in a positive vector, that to me would be a success. Great. Great comments, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me uh, uh, ask Greg and Emily a question, and that is, um, uh, both Emily and John referred to uh, the, the need for trade policy to complement uh, what we're doing um, and the importance of market access arrangements. In an environment in which um, trade agreements appear unlikely in the near term, what other tools do we have at our disposal to incentivize our allies and partners to work with us uh, on this agenda? Be interested in your thoughts on that. And, and John, I, I want to um, uh, ask you about this question of uh, the race to the bottom concern that, that, uh, uh, that Mike addressed briefly. Um, it does uh, appear that there's a fair amount of coordination going on across governments on these strategies. How do, how do you and how does industry view, uh, your, your industry members view this, um, this risk that we have multiple countries now pursuing uh, strategies to sustain key elements of the semiconductor industry at home? Uh, how do you see your, your industry navigating all of that? Let me, let me start with Emily, Greg, and then John, and then we'll open it up. Sure. At the risk of uh, imperiling myself here in front of a former USTR official, uh, let me say a couple of additional words about the supply chains pillar of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And I think there's a tendency um, to look at some of these communiques that come out and think, well, there's not really a whole lot there. But if you actually look at the front drawing agenda, it's very ambitious. We're talking about moving really complex, very intricate supply chains entire countries away from, from where they are right now. And it's not unreasonable to start with this foundational level of creating more transparency, um, letting your partner countries and economies know what you produce, what your uh, domestic private sector is interested in producing that they're not currently doing. I think on the trade pillar of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, there are um, a lot of options that the U.S. government has when it comes to raising standards and uh, helping tr uh, trading partners facilitate trade on the ground. And this spans from some of the more logistical aspects of trade, like making sure that your port is operating efficiently, uh, to making sure that your uh, trade departments are adequately staffed. That, again, goes back into part of the export control uh, considerations, or just to make sure that you have enough people kind of running the trade departments to make sure that the, the protect and promote is uh, happening um, sufficiently in concert with the other. You know, Emily's the positive trade uh, person around here, and I have basically nothing to add, um, except perhaps one thing, which is, 
You know, the United States is rethinking trade. Um, I would just say the conversations in Washington today about trade are very different from those 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And it's because economic security is at the top of the agenda of a lot of countries. Um, if you look at the statement that came out of the G7, this is really top of mind. And so I think that any new you know, trade framework is going to have to take into account this sort of new political and geopolitical equilibrium uh, where economic security really matters. And a lot of previous trade agreements hadn't really been thinking in those terms. If I could just add one quick thing there. I, I totally agree with you about the G7. If you haven't read the joint statement, I highly recommend that for kind of an articulation of not only where the US stands, but where some of our key allies stand. But if you look at the broader G7+, plus, which includes countries who are outside the core seven and then expanded even further to the G20, there are a few countries that are kind of deciding right now where they want to stand in the future. India clearly last week signaled that it's shifting more towards uh, the US camp. Uh, actually, the European Union also recently announced its economic security strategy last Tuesday that also kind of gets a little bit further into this camp. But there are a lot of uh, other diverse countries like Indonesia or the Philippines that I think are still trying to stake out where they stand, what they need to do to deepen trade cooperation with the United States. And that is a tremendous opportunity for USTR and the Commerce Department to really get it right and help advise countries on how they can raise their hand to participate more concertedly. So I'm optimistic that we'll actually make very good use of this shift uh, because uh, the risks of failure are too high. I love it, a note of optimism. I love that when trade came up in our discussion here, it started to thunder outside. So uh, <laughs> it's good to have a more optimistic note. John, thoughts on um, the race to the bottom and well, the risk to industry? Well, um, at the risk of sounding glib, um, at least we're in a race now. Um, you know, it, it, what was the choice before everyone around us incentivizing uh, uh, chip manufacturing? We just sat here on our on our hands and watching it. So, so there is a risk of kind of mis, uh, misallocation of resources and things like that. But again, one of the at least one of the great things about uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, program is it's where stuff is going to be put is going to be very heavily reliant on what, where industry thinks it should be put. So, uh, because as I said, there's going to be huge financial private sector stakes involved here, um, and I think for governments. I uh, to think there's going to be some kind of careful rocket science, neuroscience, uh, 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 um, neurosurgeon coordination. I think that that's asking too much of the governments. But I do think governments can do a lot of information sharing that could be very, very helpful to kind of figuring out where all this is going. And that's where the IPEF agenda becomes and, more and, valuable. And one, one really important thing here is, you know, we've done some, some work on this and some analytics on this. and. And the, the industry is just on a growth tra uh, trajectory. A lot of analysts are saying this $550 billion industry right now by 2030, which is seven years away, is going to be a $1 trillion industry. So the great news is the pie is getting bigger, and all the pieces of the pie are getting bigger as well. Good. Excellent. We have time for a question or two uh, from the floor for anyone who may be interested. Yes, right here, please. My name is Shalala. I'm from American University of Washington College of Law, and I will do my SJD on semiconductors, uh, which I will cover legislative part uh, that the United States may face in future. For uh, because, as you know, uh, European Union countries and other countries they have their own now semiconductor policy. For example, U European Union countries they want to increase their semiconductor uh, to 20 percent in 2030. So I, I'm curious uh, if when uh, once United States increase its semiconductor uh, production, how it's going to be implicated in export and import controls? Thank you. Hmm. Greg, do you want to take a stab at that first? Sure. So you know the European Union having explicit market share targets. Uh, it's not really the approach you know, that the United States is taking here. We do say that we want more of the chips that are used in America to be made in America, 
Uh, but it's not so explicit as to sort of say that we want 20% of global market share to be the United States. I did, you know, uh, press the previous speaker on uh, metrics, and that wasn't on them, although perhaps I missed it in the vision paper. Um, on your second question about, you know, aligning this with export controls and import controls, um, that's absolutely uh, going to happen to some greater or lesser degree. Um, to, to, to begin, the uh, specific protections uh, regarding investment in China uh, that are in the CHIPS Act, so companies that accept CHIP Act, CHIPS Act investment are prevented from making certain types of investments and expanding capacity in China. The technology performance thresholds defined in the CHIPS Act are aligned to the technology performance thresholds in the October 7th export controls. And so my point is there is already an effort in this administration to sort of align uh, semiconductor investment policy, semiconductor export control policy, uh, perhaps in the not too distant future, outbound investment uh, screening policy. It's all meant to be part of a unified uh, economic competitiveness framework. Um, and I believe that US allies in Europe um, are thinking along similar terms, although you know, their, par their policies may be more advanced or less advanced, uh, depending on the segment. John, is there anything you want to offer on this? When it comes to export controls, you just got to have uh, cooperation from your allies. We had a turbulent experience a few years ago where we had a bunch of unilateral export controls thrown down, and um, it, uh, it um, passed a lot of market share to non-Chinese competitors overseas and uh, the national security objective was not achieved because the uh, Chinese company was getting its its goods from somewhere else so that's a kind of a clear-cut example of where you need to have key allies uh, um, involved yeah this by in definition controls. has to be a, a friends focused and agenda. I would say the same goes for any kind of outbound investment filtering regime mm -hmm. If we slap a bunch of rules on our own companies, well, you know, uh, others will jump in and, and, and fill a vacuum if, if there's not collaboration with allies. Yeah. That's great. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. So I, I want to first say you can find links to the two papers we've been referencing up here. Great papers. On the CSIS webpage, on the announcement uh, page for this event. So please do take the opportunity to read those papers, and uh, please join me in a round of applause for uh, Greg, Emily, and John. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.